Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I am the social media manager at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and today we have a really, uh, a, a re a really cool topic uh, to discuss with you on finding another citizen science initiative called This Detective, which we're going to talk about and was just launched today. Right, John? That's correct. Today. Okay. okay so. Uh, with me to, with me is, uh, uh, you guys remember him, Dr. Ian O'Neill from Discovery News. Hi, Ian. Thank you for joining me. And he's going to help me with the discussion today and, and finding out more the Space Telescope Science Institute. And we are going to be talking about a new citizen science initiative uh, called Dis Detective. And with me today is uh, the, the PIs and the people involved. Uh, let me start from my right and going to left. Uh, Dr. Mark Kushner from uh, NASA Goddard. Hi, Mark. Hi, Tony. Hi, and he is. Are you the you're the PI, right? Yeah. Or, okay, great. So he'll he'll be talking a lot about uh, uh, the uh, uh, the project itself and where it was where it uh, originated from. Also with me is Dr. John Debus from the Space Telescope Science Institute. He's an astronomer here. Hi, John. It's good to see you again. Hey, Tony. <laughs> it's it's uh, we did a we did a, another hangout a while back that I thought was really awesome. Also on uh, on exoplanets and, and and planetary disks. So welcome back. Uh, and Laura White, Dr. Laura White from the Zooniverse and Adler Planetarium. Uh, she is involved with the uh, project from the Zooniverse perspective. So welcome back, Laura. It's good to see you again. Thanks, Tony. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So um, protoplanetary disks. That's the topic or that's the science that we're working on here um, John and and Mark you guys are you guys are heavily into to this why don't you describe a little bit about what this research involves what what are you guys doing all day long let's start with all Mark. day long you check our email <laughs> 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 well, you're not checking email and turning off windows that that are feeding back YouTube videos what else are you doing Hello. Well, uh, I guess I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. That's what. Yeah. Um, I study disks and the planets that live in them, and uh, I try to understand how planets form, where planets form, why planets form, and, and whether there are any planets out there that can support life. And how far? How long have you been doing this? How? How? Uh, it, this sounds to me like an area of research that's pretty new. Is this a, am I right, or is this something that's been going on for quite a while? It is. The very first planets were discovered in the 90s, and uh, you know, those discoveries just been on its head. But it's, it's, uh, it's been really exciting to be part of, of this growing field. And, uh, and, and John, you, this, is also, this is not the only thing you study, right? You also do other things as well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But this is one of your main areas of research, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. So I really like looking at dust around different things. So I think the last time we talked about dust around dead stars, and this is more dust around baby stars. And uh, here at the institute, it's a really great place to work on looking at debris disks. So you were talking about protoplanetary disks, and that's where planets start forming. And then after all the giant planets have formed, we often see these big dusty disks uh, that have sort of lived on beyond giant planet formation. They don't have a lot of gas, but they have tons of dust, and they tend to have pretty interesting shapes and structures in them. So Mark also does a lot of work with these kinds of disks, too. So I like taking pictures of them and seeing in sort of very fine detail what these uh, disks look like. So I so there's a distinction then between I said protoplanetary disk that is a stage that's a little bit earlier than what we're discussing here then this is right. debris disks which are a little bit after the major planets had formed and what's left behind. Well the nice thing about this project is we'll see both the really young ones and the older ones too. Okay, all right, great. So is there any sort of uh, preference to how you begin looking for these kinds of things like if I have a telescope let's say the Hubble Space Telescope, or you just got through talking about going to Keck, uh, where do you look for these things? What are, how do you even start? Uh, let's go with you, John. Oh, okay. So 
I, I'm sure Mark was going about about to say the same thing, but actually. Uh, Back in the mid 80s, there was the satellite called IRAS, which was an all sky infrared survey. And that was really one of the first ways that people found evidence for these kinds of disks, at least like debris disks, because they saw that some stars that looked pretty normal at shorter wavelengths were way much brighter in the mid infrared wavelengths. And they attributed this to dust. And when people started looking at these stars, with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and with other te other telescopes, they started seeing that these excesses were due to dust disks that you could actually resolve out. So the first thing you want to do is you want to look for disks that are too bright in the infrared wavelengths of light. Okay, so that's 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 a pretty important point then because this without infrared. Uh, telescopes then this this research probably wouldn't be possible either and that's another reason why this is a pretty new uh, field of study because the infrared detectors are re the, the one the kind of detectors that have enough resolution that might be able to re resolve some of these disks are relatively new as well I mean that they've been coming on well they've been making big strides since the 90s but uh, uh, I think they came into their own in like early 2000 mid 2005 infrared detectors of all different kinds became able to resolve these things so they're pretty that's another reason why I think this science is only just now getting started uh, is that right yeah and maybe Mark can talk more yeah okay yeah building infrared detectors is a bit of a uh, voodoo uh, <laughs> I know <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean there's some of them that uh, where in order to, to tune the band pass you have to uh, more or less literally put them inside a, 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 a uh, plant, a vice, and just kind of squish them until they give you the right properties. Yeah, and the uh, and they were, at least when I was working with uh, the ones that I did at the uh, the High Altitude Observatory, they were, um, they were pretty, they were pretty, the failure rate of making them was pretty high, and it was, it was a difficult thing to do, but anyway, uh, the detectors are, are now uh, it's sort of mature enough that these, these kinds of things can get done pretty well. So, um, so you, do you do you guys use the Hubble Space Telescope very much for this, or is it what what are the primary instruments for looking at these uh, and finding these disks? John? Oh yeah, sure. So, uh, like I said, IRAS was sort of the first telescope to tr to really start where you were starting to look for them and find them in large numbers, and then with Spitzer being launched. Uh, sort of in the early 2000s, that was another really great telescope for finding these disks unresolved. You couldn't, you couldn't see the disk properties at all. You just knew that they had extra mid-infrared light. And then the next upgrade is really is sort of wise because that was uh, an all-sky survey just like IRAS was, but it was up 10 to 100 times more sensitive than, than IRAS was. So hope that that's bringing in mi you know, millions of sources, new sources to look at. But then the idea is once you find that these objects seem to have disks around them, you can follow them up uh, with uh, high contrast imaging, try to actually see the disks themselves. And that you can do either with Hubble or with some of the most advanced adoptive optics systems from the ground. And those are really your two options right now. Um, but hopefully, uh, in a few years, we'll also have the James Webb Space Telescope, which hopefully will also really clean up on resolving a lot of these disks and uh, turning them into lots of pretty pictures. That's true. There's a lot of things that, that I think we're looking forward to from uh, from JWST. But the uh, the the couple couple of things I wanted to point out while John was talking is we should talk a little bit about. Um, what adaptive optics is. Adaptive optics is a thing that many ground-based observatories have to uh, sort of compensate for the fact that they're underneath the Earth's atmosphere. They are these electronic systems that will uh, generally shoot out an artificial light source like a laser or a guide to make an artificial star and then try to mo and then look at the light from that and then very fast they will correct and cancel out the, the effects of the atmosphere and using all kinds of mirrors and, and little flexible uh, servos and things like that to get the effects of the atmosphere out because it, it severely restricts what you can actually resolve on the ground, uh, what the atmosphere does when it's uh, you know boiling and light is trying to travel through all of these cells of different densities and things like that. And when we say resolved, that means that we can actually pick out detail from it. The, if you just see a blob, 
uh, then you you know that's not a resolved object. It, and let, if there's more detail in there, you want either a larger instrument or a larger uh, mirror or something like that to uh, to give you better detail. And and uh, that's what that's what we mean by by resolving these things. So um, the is there any? Let me ask you guys, and and maybe Mark, uh, you you can speak to this. The uh, is there any sense of the the statistics? Well, first of all, you're looking in the in our galaxy, right? Or are you looking in other galaxies? We're looking all over the sky, and the odds are best that we'll end up seeing things in our galaxy. But uh, you know, there's there's no special uh, filter we have that that uh, prevents us from looking beyond our galaxy. Well, it would be limited by resolving them, right? I mean, you could actually resolve disks in other galaxies. No, none of the disks that we're searching for with disk detected are resolved. Okay. So, okay, we'll get to that in just a minute. But are they in our galaxy? The ones that we're searching for are in our galaxy. Okay, okay, good. And, and so my, that leads to my question. Are there any statistics that sort of point to how many stars do you expect in our galaxy to have these kind of uh, debris disks around them? Uh, you know, roughly speaking, is there any sense of that, or is it too early? To, is that what you're trying to find out with this? That is one of the things we're trying to learn. Okay. But we have some ideas from previous searches, like the IRAS survey that John introduced. And that taught us that something like 5% of stars that are similar to the sun have okay. disks. So maybe 1 out of 20. Oh, OK. All right, well, I furiously um, closed all of my windows <laughs> at the beginning of this thing. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit now about the, the, the disk detective itself. You, uh, who, who, first of all, whose idea was it? Who, who came up with the idea? Well, the idea goes back, we really have to start by thanking the, uh, the folks who flew the WISE mission, <laughs> Ned Wright and, and, uh, and, uh, and those folks for, for, for flying such an amazing survey. I mean, uh, that, got re that, was, that got repurposed, didn't it? The WISE was launched to do one thing, and now it got re it was woken up again. Am I remembering right? That's right. Um, WISE completed its original mission and was repurposed as MuroWISE to study asteroids. What's so great is that this mission can do all kinds of different science. It doesn't just observe disks. It's good at finding brown dwarfs studying asteroids, at studying planetary nebulae and galaxies and, and all kinds of stuff like that. It just so happens that John and I, when we were starting to work on this project together, Disk Detective, well, we love disks. So so we built something that would help us find more of the disks, disks that we love. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong. Y stands for Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, right? That's right. Okay, so, and like you said, it's like a wide field telescope. It looks in the infrared. You can see a lot of the sky at one time, and apparently you can take many, many images and get, and get kind of deep with it. And so it had, it had done its thing, and then they turned it off, and then you guys decided, or someone decided, that, hey, well, there's a lot of good science that we can do with this. Let's turn it back on, and NeoWise was born. So, uh, yeah, so this, this initiative, this uh, disk detective initiative wouldn't be possible without without WISE. So that's the data set you're using, without correct? A great instrument like WISE. Yeah. WISE detected three quarters of a billion sources all around the sky. When you say sources, what does that mean? What do you mean? Bright dots of some kind, whether they're galaxies or discs. Bright infrared dots. Or, or brown dwarfs or who knows what. White dwarfs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so... Um, Ian says, uh, Ian, go ahead. you got a couple questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to find that video? Because I can probably step in for a little bit here. But I've just had a few, I just had a few questions already. Because um, I met John. When did I meet you first in person? I mean, it's strange to say meet somebody in person when you're always speaking online. But we did actually physically meet. Oh, it was yeah. in LA, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a double AS meeting, an American Astronomical Society meeting, maybe like five or six years ago. 2008, yeah, you're right, yeah. it was 2008. There was a lot, of, um, a lot of conferences around then. But one thing I found fascinating about your work, specifically back, back then, was that you were looking at white dwarf stars. I mean, that was that was your thing. And the thing that blew me away, because at the time I was a blogger, I was blogging for Universe Today, uh, I found it fascinating that you were 
analyzing white dwarfs and saying, okay, this white dwarf has got a debris disc around it and its atmosphere has been polluted by, um, I think it was heavier metals that suggested that there was so, you know, some, some form of planetary body or asteroids in orbit. And you were saying this is the future of our, of our solar system because ultimately our star, the sun, is going to is going to die and it's going to turn into a, a white dwarf. So actually what we're looking at is the far future of our sun. And yep. I find that fascinating. So how does that, I mean, obviously this, this carries over into this new project. How, how many of these stars do you hope to find that are perhaps future versions of our solar system, perhaps these you know, doomsday versions of, uh, right. of what happens to our sun? Actually, well, so in, that's how I got into WISE, is using WISE to look for these dusty white dwarfs. But I actually think with Disk Detective, we may not find too many like that, because a lot of the white dwarfs are just way too faint to be detected in all of the WISE bands that we're looking at. So when, you, when we look at the Disk Detective website, you'll see that we're looking at all four of the different infrared channels that WISE was detecting stars and galaxies in. And white dwarfs, because they're so faint and so far away, typically, you only catch them in a couple of the WISE channels. So the way we selected our sample of stars on Disk Detective was actually looking for things that had detections at all four wavelengths. So I don't actually know how many white dwarfs we would find in this one. Maybe not very many at all. Maybe we'll find some planetary nebulae or red giant stars that might be very dusty too. And those also would tell us something about the future of our sun. Because you know, maybe the dust that these red giant stars push off are enough to uh, explain some of the things that we see around white dwarfs as well. That's cool. Well, that's going to be my mission then to try and find some white, <laughs> white dwarfs for you. Great. You know, it's, it's a very cool little platform because I had to play with it um, a couple of days ago, and it's uh, it's very easy. It's very. I like the Zooniverse, Zooniverse interface as well, and I think it's uh, very cool. But how, how do you think like um, like human factors will come into play with this? Because it's going to be you're looking at an image and you're trying to find um, stars with disks around them. Um, I know that previous projects in Zooniverse have you know looked at you know human um, influence, you know, by, uh, selection bias and stuff. How do you think that's going to affect your results? Maybe Laura yeah, should talk. Maybe yeah, that's I bet a good, Laura that's would. A good question for Laura. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah for Laura. Yeah. So, um, all of the Zooniverse projects kind of work on the same, um, use the same method, and that is that we get multiple people to look at every object. So. It actually doesn't matter if one person is better at doing these, and or you know we, we kind of average things out at the end, um, and there is kind of some data reduction that happens when a sort of final final catalogue is being collected together. Um, but generally speaking, it's just the power of averages, right? The more people you get to look at something, the more um, reliable the the result is. So um, and. It really depends on the project, because so different projects we get different numbers of people to look at each in, in each object, and we kind of tweak that as the project goes along, and we find out how good people are at a particular task. Okay, so I have, I think, it, let, let's move on now. I, I was able to recall all of my windows that were up. Thank you, Ian, for giving me an opportunity to do that, uh, as I was you know, frantically closing them earlier. So I'm back up, and and let's let's start introducing the Disk Detective uh, website now. I have. Uh, a video that was made at Goddard, and uh, I think what we talked about doing was I will show that on my screen share, but the audio won't be uh, able to be heard. So uh, Mark is going to make some comments over as uh, as I do that. So let me start my screen share, and and uh, I will get that video up here. I've got the script in front of me, so I'm going to do a live reading of it. Oh, wow. Okay, well, I, my screen share button has to work, or else nothing's going to happen. I'm pushing it. Mark, I dare you to do it in a Will Shatner style. <laughs> okay. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is crazy. The wise mission imaged about uh, half a billion billion stars. Every button is working, but the screen share now. This has been, this is one of those things where it's just, it just figures. Um, 
<clears throat> John, could I ask you to uh, pull up the URL that is in the chat box for the Wii U? Uh, oh, actually, I will send you the URL. It's just right here. Uh, can my screen share button seems to not want to work? Okay. So in there is uh, is an is a link to NASA. If you could click on that and pull up the video, um, I'd appreciate it. Yes, I will do that. Okay, and I will. And if you just uh, hit your full, the full screen on the video and then push play, um, that should do it. Uh, yes, except for some reason. Is your screen share not working either? No, I'll I'll get there. <laughs> it helps when your window has a scroll bar. Okay, so. So screen share first, and then do full yeah. screen on the video? Yeah. All right. It's not working for me either. Oh, great. OK. Can anybody share their screen? Yeah, I'll give it a go. I've got the video up. I'll see if I can share it now. Thanks, Ian. So technical problems. So if that that's going to. There it is. Thank goodness. Okay, good. So there. So we see Ian's screen. Um, okay, go ahead and and, and uh, make it. If you can go ahead and hit the full screen and then push play, it should do it. Oh no! Just hit escape. It went away. Hey y'all! Why don't you all go to YouTube and watch this thing? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, John. Or go ahead, Mark. Start yapping. Yeah, go ahead. Can you scroll scroll down a little bit, Ian? Yeah. Was it working, or did it freeze up? Well, now we're looking at the upper left corner. Okay. All right. I'll Hold restart it. it. Yes. Huh. Okay, so we're having technology. Yeah, this is kind of weird. Sorry, one second. So I'll, I'll restart it. it. It keeps going. What can you see now? This is, yeah, it's not working. It started up, and then it stopped. Oh, great. Okay, well, um, that's, so let's let's improvise. So let's go ahead and talk about what the video was going to say. So it was, a, it's an introduction into this, into this detective, into the, into the, uh, uh, the, the citizen science project you you had started. So let's go ahead and start talking about that. What are you hoping to do with this detective? Sure. Mark? Oh, a quick summary. So, as we were saying, a big quest of astronomers for the last few decades has been discovering exoplanets. One of the ways that we do this is we, we search for young stars that are surrounded by dust. Dust indicates planetary disks and debris disks. Because those are the environments where planets form. That's the environment where the solar system forms. The WISE mission has just been this remarkable tool for finding this. From 2010 to 2011, the WISE mission scanned the entire sky. And the, the images are just spectacular. I hope you've had a chance to see some of them. You know, these green magenta clouds of, of, of gas and dust and no stars. But anyway, John and I are most interested in the disks. So we wanted to try to find all of the, the disks in this area. And in three quarters of a billion objects, you know there are going to be disks everywhere. But here's the trick. When you see a source in the wise camera, it's hard to tell by computer anyway whether it's likely to be a star with a disk, or whether it's more likely to be a background galaxy, or, a, or an active galactic nucleus, or, or, or an asteroid, or, or planetary nebula, or, or even an image artifact. And what we learned looking at these things, what, what several scientists learned with these things, was that you have to check them all by eye. You would try to program computers to, to sort through the, you know, 
you go to bring really dizzy. And you could only get so far. You just have to use the power of a human eye. So, with this in mind, we launched Disk Detective Battle. And in Disk Detective, you see animated flipbooks of images from WISE, from the two mass sky survey, and from the uh, digitized Palomar sky survey, and some di images also from the, the Sloan survey. And you see flipbooks of these images in several wavelengths. And looking at those images, you're able to spot the, the background interlopers and the false positives, the objects we want to discard in a sort of natural way. It's almost like spotting prey in a dense jungle, something that the human eye is very natural to. So, um, what we're going to do is, with your help, once we find all of these new disks that we hope to find in the data, we're going to follow them up with the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, and with ground-based space telescopes. And these are going to be great targets to search for planets around, um, extrasolar planets. We'll learn more about how planet formation occurs, where it occurs. We hope to find new groups of young stars, and generally study how planetary systems evolve during the lifetime. So we're looking forward to working with you. OK. Thanks. Getting some feedback, Tony. I know. <laughs> that was a piece of whale song. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> Um, so I, I just got one question with, uh, I mean, a recent thing that's come up um, with uh, some infrared studies of other stars is the detection of um, dust and cometary material. Are you hoping to find uh, star systems like that, like the former Holt system? Are you going to be able to see things like that? Anything with a debris disk, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, well, so one of our science team members, Debbie Padgett, is... Uh, part of the WISE science team, and they actually used WISE to look for uh, debris disks around uh, nearby stars that have their distances measured. And so it was a subset of all the different sources that WISE had detected, a very small subset, you know, when you think about three quarters of a billion. But what they did is they did find maybe a few dozen really good candidate debris disk sources, and then they followed them up with the Hubble Space Telescope and some of the targets that they looked at have disks around them that you actually can image very nicely, very much like Fomal Hut or Beta Pictoris, some of these really famous debris disks that have these beautiful images. So that's exactly what we're hoping to do, just sort of on a larger scale if possible. Okay, so I have a, finally, a screenshot up of the website. Um, and so let's go ahead and, and start showing people what they need to do. So I don't have I don't have any kind of um, uh, account with. Well, I do have an account with Zooniverse, but uh, why don't you? Don't you don't need it. I don't think you need it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, just get started. Okay, so I start classifying. Mm-hmm. Right. So the first thing you'll see is a little tutorial that comes up and tries to walk you through. Uh, the whole process in a very hopefully intuitive way. I mean, the Zooniverse people do a really great job with this. So, you know, when when we were when Mark and I and and the other science team members were first designing this thing, you know, I had made a little PowerPoint slide of what we thought it would look like, and uh, yeah, they did a much better design job than I ever could okay, have done. Okay, so the URL that I'm at is disdetective.org. Very simple to remember, and this is what you were presented with. Um, I clicked on the Start Classifying button, and then and now this comes up. So it says, right. using the interface, we find new debris disk stars by looking at flipbooks of images. And um, uh, so click the Play button to start one flipbook. So, right, yeah. So you'll see different images at different wavelengths from the three surveys that were uh, that we're primarily using. So the first ones start in visible wavelengths. And then they go on to the near infrared, which is just which is light that's just a bit redder than what our eyes can see, all the way to the wise 
uh, wavelengths, the wise images, which are in the mid-infrared. So these, this is very red light. And the idea is that these are all stars that we think are brighter in the infrared than they are in the visible, but we need to weed out all the galaxies and the other stuff. So as you're flipping through, you'll see a couple of different, um, you might see just something that looks like a blob, right? So this one looks like a blob. It's just a different size blob in all these images because each of these surveys could resolve uh, images better or worse. So two mass sort of had the best spatial resolution, followed by the visible with the POS images. And unfortunately, WISE, even though it's a great, great telescope in a lot of ways, it has sort of blurry vision compared to the other surveys. So the, the a star will look more blobby as you get to longer wavelengths. So this one we consider a pretty good candidate because it looks just like a single blob within that red circle. So if you uh, continue through, it'll sort of tell you, I think, uh, what to look for. If you click on the little continue button, okay. Tony. Okay, so yeah, on the bottom it also says what instrument was there and the wavelength that, that I'm looking Right, at. yeah, just to help you. And you can so, drag it along and look around if, if you want to take more time, for example. For a star to have a debris disk, it should, be mo it should mostly be contained within the red circle. And this red circle, just it, it, it's always the same size? Yeah, that's roughly the, the ability of the WISE telescope to, to separate things out at the longest wavelength. Okay. Because that's we're really relying on that longest, that reddest color to tell us whether there's dust around these stars or not. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the shorter wavelengths where we have more ability to resolve things out or to image things to see whether there are multiple objects within that circle or whether there's a galaxy that looks like a galaxy at shorter wavelengths but just looks like a blob at longer wavelengths. And so... Those are the kinds of things that we want to get rid of if we can. Okay. And it said that now I'm being, it's talking about a scrub bar now. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sometimes you'll need to yeah, look at individual so frames. Yeah, so if you, right, so Tony's now clicking on this thing. So if you want to have control looking at all the different wavelengths or going to a particular image, you can slide that around however you want to do it to really explore the images as much as possible. Right, so here's a Digital Sky Survey 2 image. Uh, this one has two mass. Um, wise, there's a wise image, and these are all of the same object. Yep, yep, okay. that's the same object, just in different colors. Okay, so as you go through the flipbook, you should pay attention to what survey each image is from. Uh, you'll be looking for different features and images for different surveys. For example, non-circular objects and images from the DSS-2 and 2-mass surveys is a sign that it's not a disk. Is that true here? Um, Non-circular, is that circular? That looks circular to me. It's Yeah, these are pretty circular. Now, obviously, you know, there's going to be imperfections. If, if uh, yeah, we are, we're, a lot of our users have already found weird things in the data, like uh, star, like satellite trails or asteroid trails. So you might find a couple weird things, but uh, okay. that's okay. <laughs> Weirder the better. Yeah, exactly. Who knows what cool. we'll find. All right, so now you classify. After you watch the flipbook at least once, you can select a classification for the star. This is a good candidate since it is round and entirely contained within the circle. Uh, go ahead and select none of the above slash good candidate, then click finish. None of the above or... Uh, yeah, it's all the way down right. there. Yep. Okay. And then you and hit then, finish. Yep. <laughs> now, and now Mark, Mark gets notified. Right, and, and, and you'll get a voicemail from Mark with that noise every time you do one. He's done it about 10,000 times already. Oh, good. Well, it's kind of me getting you feedback from my um, Imposter. Imposter. Okay, so here we are onto, a, onto, a, onto another one here. Right, yeah, so you, so. Kind of, you closed out the tutorial, but... Oh, um, no, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You can always get it back if you want. But if you go up to the top, you see you have a couple of buttons up there that you can kind of play around with. They should tell you what they are. Yeah, there we go. Well, now, yeah, there you go. You got back to the tutorial. You can close that out. Okay. I think uh, if you go to the one that looks like a book and click Here. on that, yeah, that gives you different oh, examples neat. of all the different things that you might run across. 
good candidate. So you play this to get a good candidate. Right. Yeah, and so people can look through and sort of get a feel for what they're looking for. Okay. Uh, and, and there are a lot of different, you know, the, 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 mostly what you'll find are things like the galaxy, right, where they look very much like a galaxy at the shorter wavelengths, but when you get to the longer wavelengths, it looks, looks more like a star. And those are the ones we really want to put in a different category. Okay, so we're looking for things that are round, uh, stay inside the uh, circle, and don't look like any of these things. Right. That's okay. You got it. Okay. Uh, yeah. And if you close that out, one other thing you can do, uh, click on the the little what looks like a uh, infinity. <laughs> no, sorry. On the top, there's a star, and then there's a little like word bubble. So click on the word bubble. If you go there, that'll take you to the talk the talk area. And if if you have uh, an account, I think you'll see more more things there. But basically, if you find an unusual object, you can uh, you know start a discussion about it or tag some things about it. And and this is something that I think most of the Zooniverse sites have something similar to this. And I th it's it's really cool because this is where everyone gets to talk amongst themselves. Uh, about these different objects and and uh, ask questions of both the scientists and the the Zooniverse people. Oh, so it's got a social aspect as well. This is this is pretty good. Yep. I don't know if Laura wants to talk more about these kinds of things in, in relation to the other Zooniverse projects, but this is something that I think is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I seem to have forgotten yeah. my. Yeah. Yeah. This. This is something that we realized was important um, during our very first project, Galaxy Zoo. Um, it's kind of where the science that you don't expect to happen, happens. I mean, all Zooniverse projects start with very kind of well-defined questions that need to be answered. Um, but it's the serendipitous stuff that comes out of people actually getting together and talking about science that's really exciting. Okay. <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> this time, <laughs> blender. <laughs> Sorry, okay. we've 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 got someone doing some cleaning. But I know. Let's bring it all in. This, this hangout, this hangout's got it all, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, apparently my it, I had one for Galaxy Zoo, um, but I don't know if that transferred over into Zooniverse or not. So. That, that yeah, no worries. Yeah, uh, it, it certainly it certainly should have done. So okay, it's I, I, probably, I've forgotten my password. Then. Yeah, just at some so. point you might just want to hit reset your password, and they'll send you they'll send okay. you a link. That you yeah, can I'll do that. that. But yeah, I can't you know, Galaxy unfortunately Zoom. demonstrate the social aspect of it uh, very well. But you know that is that is a, a really important part of these. And and I don't know, Laura, do you remember? Of course you remember. Um, there was a uh, uh, a discovery made. Um, by a woman uh, using, I think it was one of the, uh, I think it was Galaxy Zoo. I can't remember the exact one. Exactly. But anyway, she she contributed to a paper. Uh, Yanni, mm -hmm. I think her name was. Yeah, um, it was Hanny Van Arkel. Um, Thank you. And yes, it was I, it was uh, Hanny's Vorverp. It was an entirely new astronomical um, object that had never been discovered before. Yeah. And um, yep, she's been in I think more than one paper actually. And in fact, at some point, they even po pointed the Hubble telescope at this object to do follow-up observations. So that's that's a yeah, superb example of the kind of exciting stuff that can happen when people get together and talk about the science that happens on Zooniverse projects. So was that um, feature built into Galaxy Zoo at the time? Were they able to discuss this thing, or was this feature born out of the of discoveries like this, where people were seeing things yeah. in the Zooniverse product? and not knowing what they were and wanting to be able to talk about it. Is that where that so, kind of came from? So the original projects had um, forums, just kind of uh, your standard forum tools attached to them. And I believe Galaxy Zoo and Moon Zoo uh, were the first projects that had these forums. Um, but it soon became apparent that the forums kind of um, became victims of their own success. People were using them so much, and so many threads were being con created, and people were having to go in and reorganize threads. And um, we wanted to kind of create a system where you could create collections of interesting objects that you found, so that things that you favorite when you're doing observations could then make a collection that you could use and potentially um, 
uh, show share with other people. Because um, another kind of great example of a serendipitous dis discovery were the green pea galaxies. So this was a new oh, yes. type of ultra compact galaxy that was discovered by volunteers on the Zooniverse, uh, on the Galaxy Zoo Forum, who kind of said, hey, what are all these little pea things that we keep seeing? <laughs> um, and they made collections of them. And we realized that, you know, that's what scientists do all the time. They collect together things that interest them, you know, and that's a very kind of important feature. So we built this talk tool, this talk discussion tool that's attached to all our projects now in an attempt to kind of make it easier for people to make collections of things and also to have discussions around individual objects. So, hey, I found this thing. It's really cool. Anyone else seen it? Anyone else got any thoughts about what it might be? Or, hey, I've made this collection of really cool things and now I want to talk about them. I know. This, I think it's one of the most exciting times to be uh, not just, I've always called this the golden age of astronomy because of all the really great telescopes and science that's being done and discoveries that are being made, but the, the, this aspect of it, this, this ability for just, you know, the, the tools that are out there for ordinary, uh, you know, the, the regular citizens to just, who aren't, do this, who, who love this stuff but don't get a chance to do it every day or do it professionally can contribute in a real meaningful way. So yeah. that's, this is a very exciting time. So let's go back a little, let's go back to the, um, to the uh, website. So, is there anything else we should be showing, uh, John or, or Mark? Do you want yeah, me to? Uh... Thing. So, huh? uh, so there are all these great serendipitous discoveries made at Galaxy Zoo. I just want to point out that with this detective, we guarantee you a serendipitous discovery. <laughs> wow, guarantee, <laughs> huh? If you don't get a make Nobel Prize winning discovery with this detective, I will personally refund your money. <laughs> wow, that's that's amazing. <laughs> so this one that I'm I'm looking at right now, this looks like a uh, a good candidate to me. Yeah, it looks good. Go what go back down. That? Yeah, yeah. I I'd say that's good. All right, so good candidate. Winner. Yeah. <laughs> I I expect I expect my Nobel Prize. Okay. I'm printing it now. Okay, you're pretty good. <laughs> okay, so now I've got another one, and I noticed the finish, the finish button doesn't come up until I've gone all the way through it. That's right. So I can't. I have to look at every wavelength that you've got, every every image for this object that you have before I can classify it. Yep, no Maybe cheating. This one, this one looks good too. Yeah, uh, I would. I, I, so I'm going to say good candidate. What are my choices here? Multiple circles, multiple objects in the red circle, extended. Beyond circle in wise images, not round in DSS or two mass. Uh, object moves off the crosshairs. Empty circle in wise images. Okay, I haven't seen any of that yet. So I've found all kinds of stuff already. So yep. I'm like totally getting you guys there. <laughs> this, is a, this is another one. So okay, and and so how come you guys don't require people to log in and sign up? I was able to do all of this anonymously. Is that on purpose? Absolutely, yeah. We wanted to keep the barrier to participation as low as humanly possible. So, you know, ideally, we'd like you to give us our email, so your email, so we can tell you about other projects that come up, and we can give you feedback and access to the talk discussion tool. But if you just want to come along and play around, we don't want to stop you from doing that. Are these um, are these weighted in any way? So, do you like is like an anonymous person? Does his or her classification mean less than someone who isn't? No. No, absolutely not. We um, we are able to kind of do some analysis on uh, the users who haven't logged in because we know their IP addresses. So we know that they were there and we can kind of find out which classifications that they did. So the, um, the, the value from unlogged in users is as great as from logged in users. Okay, so none of that. So yeah. uh, John or, or Mark, uh, what, how, what are you expecting in terms of... Um, Turnout. What do you hope? How many? How many classifications do you need uh, for you to be able to get some reasonable science done here? Uh, by the way, we're going to be discarding all of your classifications. <laughs> oh, nice. Why? <laughs> because of the feedback. Oh, I, I, I knew I was going to pay for that. <laughs> we'll never know it's you. That's you didn't right. Log That's in. right. How are you going to know? You probably get well. Probably look from the the feedback person. I guess I. Don't. <laughs> but um, yeah. So. Uh, how many how many observations or classifications do you need before um, you guys are ready to start looking at writing some papers? 
we've got half a million objects in our first list that that we'd like help. So you have a half million objects. Presumably, you want more than one classification for each one. So you're looking into the millions of, of classifications if you can get it. Right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I don't. I hope I. Uh, I can. I want to turn uh, my space warps. Uh, Laura, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Zooniverse project called Space Warps had how many millions of classifications? Whoop. You're Whoop. muted. I think you're muted. <laughs> um, I think uh, Space Warps has had a little over eight million classifications. Um, so and and then we shut the project down because they didn't need any more than eight million. Um, they kind of got the results they needed. Um, so I mean, millions of classifications is is not unusual for our projects. We're we're lucky that people are interested in astronomy. Yeah, we really are. <laughs> well, we that's couldn't true. Do it, we mean, couldn't do it without them. Uh, yeah, we we really are lucky in terms of the field we work in. It's so easy to get the public engaged because it, it, you know this this subject matter just comes naturally to us. Whether it's you know uh, a, a exoplanets or, or very distant galaxies, high redshift galaxies, protoplanetary disks, debris disks, like what you guys are talking about. Anything. It's just the the idea that we're able to look at other stars within our galaxy and do things that we haven't ever been able to really do before and learn so much. It's easy to get people engaged. It it really uh, is amazing uh, that we're lucky to, to be part of a, uh, uh, a, a field of study where that's the case. Uh, Hans Milling from uh, YouTube is saying that the spotter's guide does not work in Google Chrome. No videos are shown, just the play button and descriptions. So I thought I'd point that out. Um, that, that's one. Thank you, Hans. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get someone to look at that. Yeah, so I'll definitely look at that. Um, uh, is there any... Um, uh, Ian, do you have any other questions you'd like to ask? Yeah, I just have one question, and I don't know if, if this is a possibility, but because, of course, the other Zooniverse project, uh, Planet Hunters, um, is there any plans to do a crossover with Disc Hunters? Because, you know, they're, they're, there's kind of a natural, organic relationship there. I'm just wondering if you can, you know, pick out candidate stars and relate them to a planetary search as well as the uh, disc hunting search. Ian, yes. Um... The Planet Hunters, as it exists now, is about studying stars that were observed with Kepler. And the Kepler field overlaps with the whole sky, of course, and we're studying the whole sky. So yes, we'll be studying that whole field. Cool. Um, wait, that was the good news. The bad news is that other people <laughs> have already done it to some degree. The, this Kepler field has been, been studied to death, really, by astronomers. So I'm not sure we'll have anything new to add. For this version of Planet Hunters, future versions of Planet Hunters, I think, are going to involve other data sets. And we're going to know about debris disks and protoplanetary disks everywhere in the sky. So whatever other data they have, we'll probably have some information. Yeah, and one thing I'll add is that if, so right now, Kepler is, its future is a little uncertain because it lost all of its reaction wheels and it can't do the kind of precise uh, science that it was doing before, but the Kepler team is actually proposing for uh, an extension to the mission that's slightly different where it'll be slowly, ro you know, it'll be checking some fields that are along the solar system ecliptic because they've come up with this brilliant way of still getting really good photometry by I think aligning to the sun's magnetic field or the solar wind or, or something like that. I don't know the details but it, it's a really great idea. So I could imagine a time where if that mission goes ahead they'll have all this great Kepler style data for different patches of sky and hopefully by then Disk Detective will have told them where all the cool debris disks are and maybe there'll be some way to to overlap those two projects together in, in an interesting way so, so uh, cool. we'll see so <laughs> no cool. promises I won't Nothing's I won't give you your money back if it doesn't happen but uh, <laughs> Uh, if nothing else, I'm totally going to see about planning some kind of outreach session here at the Adler using both projects. Great. Yeah. The, nice. So, so uh, 
the Adler is. Um, uh, I haven't. I haven't been to the Adler in years. And uh, do you guys have it? What What are some of the outreach things you guys do there? Uh, so we, we have a nice field trip program that we run here that uses, um, uh, we have orreries to kind of demonstrate to kids the, the transit methods so that they can go away and use Planet Hunters. We're also working to kind of get more of our projects embedded on the mu on the museum floor. Uh, we're, we're hoping not to just, we, we think that the Zooniverse is a great thing for people to take home and do. We want to kind of have value-added experiences here at the Adler. So something that helps you better understand the science behind projects that you can then go home and do the projects when you get there. Great. Okay. Yeah. I I remember I, I, the last time I was at the Adler, I think was in the 80s. That there was a, a American Ast or a, 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 the planetary. It was a planetarium society meeting. Anyway, it was a beautiful place up there. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, we have we have the best view in the city here. Yes, definitely. Okay, so the website is discdetectives.org. It is a new uh, citizen science initiative from the Zooniverse uh, family of citizen science things. Uh, the last one of the last hangouts, a couple hangouts we did was on the M83 uh, a project that Brad Whitmore has done. Uh, so I would encourage you guys to go there and start classifying. You saw how easy it, if I can do it then anybody can do it because as we can see I can't seem to run a hangout without there being some, some technical issues but th this was a very easy website to use so I encourage you guys to go and give it a shot you can follow them at at disk underscore detective on Twitter is there anything else you wanna you wanna shout out any other social things you have a Facebook page we have a Facebook page yep is it facebook.com slash disk detective uh, does I, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> I, will, so. I will. I will post search this detective. Yeah, <laughs> I will post a link to that in the event and the description yeah. box on the YouTube video. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you guys for uh, joining me. I want to thank uh, Ian. Thank you for 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 helping me and uh, and and yeah, contributing. Sure. I really appreciate it. Uh, jo Dr. John Debus from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Laura White. Thank you also for the Zooniverse and. Dr. Mark Kushner from uh, Goddard. All of these guys have done some great work, and we hope that you will help them out and uh, and start doing some classifications on debris disks for them. It's a very interesting idea and a really, I think, a good opportunity for all of you guys to uh, to get involved. I want to apologize for the, the some of the uh, technical issues we had uh, this time around. I will. Uh, 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 correct some of that in the editing <laughs> after the oh, fact, but I but think it just enriches the hangout experience. <laughs> 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 that makes it more authentic. To yeah, me. Fingernails on the chalkboard with that feedback there. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for your patience and uh, and uh, thank you guys for watching. And as always, keep looking up.